Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 26. Today, we discuss updates on the Syrian civil war. We examine a new article discussing the trauma to a brain that occurs simply being in the vicinity of a roadside bomb blast. We cover the extremely irresponsible American general calling for a war with China within 15 years. We answer a patron's question on Posicomitatus and habeas corpus. And finally, we discuss a pending report that's very critical of Army operations during the Iraq War. Rifle upon my shoulder And a rucksack on my back Shrapnel and a hellhound on my track. When I made it to my home place, I found triumph of the will. Where once lay a shining city, stood a fortress on a Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. For those new to the show, Danny and I are two progressive veterans who take the military and veteran stories of the day and add some much needed context. Hey listeners, uh, we're going to do some headlines today for the pod and I think we've got some good ones. Uh, There's obviously never a shortage as I always say. There's never a shortage of things to talk about but I think one of the interesting things about this episode is is we're not really covering the hot issues that are dominating the mainstream media. Let's be honest. The mainstream media is really entertainment media at this point. Uh, We talked about the Saudis last week. I'm glad to see that's still in the news. I'm horrified that it took the murder of a single journalist to get into the news when the murder of 16,000 minimum Yemeni children and women and uh, non-combatant men didn't get in the news. But... First today, I'm going to talk about Syria. You guys know I've written a lot about Syria. Most of my articles about Syria are warnings. Warnings to the United States not to turn Syria into the next Iraq or the next Afghanistan or the next Libya. What do I mean by that? Let us not get dragged into the Syrian civil war and become you know, engrossed in a quagmire. Now, we will do that because America always seems to make the wrong decision when it comes to war and peace these days, but I'm still arguing against it. So uh, I read two really interesting articles. Uh, One was from NBC News and uh, and the other one was from the Military Times. And so there are two separate stories about Syria, but I think they're related. So the first one, NBC News, um, for the first time ever, the first journalist ever – traveled with General Joseph Foto, who is the CENTCOM commander in charge of all combat operations in the greater Middle East. And they went to visit the al Tanf, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, U.S. military base in the southeast corner of Syria. Tanf is a really interesting location because it's co-located with a massive refugee camp, and it's also along the axis of the um, Damascus, Baghdad, Tehran highway, okay, basically the main thoroughfare that goes from the capital of Syria to the capital of Iraq, straight through to the capital of Iran. Now, that base was implemented by the United States Army, primarily as an anti-ISIS foothold. The mission we were told, American people were told that we were in Syria to fight ISIS, right? Now, we didn't actually approve that because almost every American war these days is extra constitutional, but that's what the American people were told. Well, this article now tells us that General Joseph Fodel, as well as many other senior policymakers, are saying that the real reason for all 10th, since ISIS is mostly beaten, is that it is, quote, a crucial bulwark against Iran, and that According to the general, it plays a critical role in the American effort to diminish Iran's influence in the region. What does this mean? 
This means that Syria is the home of a new Cold War in the Middle East. It's an ongoing Cold War. It's not that new. Between the United States and Iran, between the United States and Saudi Arabia on one side, and Iran and Syria on the other. This is dangerous. This is dangerous for two reasons. Number one, the United States does not need a war with Iran. Iran has neither the will nor the capacity to really influence the United States' homeland. It has neither the will nor the capacity to attack the American homeland. We know this because no American has been killed, but uh, no American on American soil has been killed by an Iranian in the last 40 years. A lot of Saudis killed a lot of Americans, but somehow we're still allied with them. This is why I'm so concerned about this story. If the reason we're staying in Syria is to counter Iran, that is a formula for forever war. Because Iran has always and will always have interest in Syria. Why? The two regimes are allied. The two regimes are controlled by Shia factions, the Alawites in Syria and the Twelver Shia, traditional Shia in Iran. So they're always going to have a relationship. They have always had a relationship. The world didn't end because Bashar al-Assad was allied with the mullahs in Iran. So if what we're saying now is we have to stay in Syria in order to counter Iranian influence, short of an outright war, Iranian influence is not just going to go away in Syria because we have one military base in the southeast corner. So to me, this is an expansion Okay, this is an expansion of the of the intervention in Syria. You know, it was supposed to be short term. It was supposed to just be against ISIS. Well, ISIS is beat, and we found a new reason to stay. We always find a new reason to stay. That's why we are still in Afghanistan. That's why we're fighting a twenty year war. Shit, it's gonna be a thirty year war because I don't care who gets elected in twenty twenty. If it's not Bernie Sanders, <laughs> we're staying. The second story from Syria, and this is alarming as well. So America has. Two main areas it's in control of. Okay, for those of you who don't follow this, very complex. I understand if you don't follow, it's very complex. We control Al Tan from the southeast, and then we control uh, Manbij, uh, which is another area in the north slash northeast, and it's a Kurdish enclave, and we've empowered the Kurds in that area. Well, the problem is the Turks hate the Kurds in their own country, and they hate the Kurds in Syria. And the United States is allied with those Kurds. And here's where it gets even more messy. NATO includes Turkey as a member. Turkey is in the NATO alliance. We are allied with Turkey. Turkey has the second largest army behind us in the NATO alliance. And yet this week, a U.S. patrol near the Syrian region of Manbij came under fire from Turkish proxy forces. Forces that the Turkish army, which has already invaded northern Syria, has armed. So we face potentially a never-ending quagmire in the southeast of Syria, trying to counter Iran, whatever that means, and possibly a breakdown in the NATO alliance in the north, central, and northeast of the country. And so my point is this. All signs point to forever war in Syria. All signs point to the military getting sucked into Syria. And I'm appalled that senior American generals haven't stepped forward and said, hold on, I've seen this movie before in Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and it always ends poorly. But no one has the courage to say that. So what are we going to do? Probably, Henry, we are going to walk into a new 20-year war in Syria. That's just disgusting. I... I, I... And also, we're, we're, we have divided loyalties among the Kurds because there's the ones that are further to the northwest that we're saying aren't, didn't support us in the war against ISIS, and therefore they're not under our protection or any kind of protection, if you want to call it that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're staring down the barrel of something truly, truly fucking awful, and I hope it doesn't come to that, but going over the history of the Cold War, there were way too many close calls in that huge 50 year span. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's just a recipe for disaster. It's just irresponsible. It's irresponsible behavior by the United States government and something has to be done. We need a new anti-war movement. We need veterans to speak out. Listeners, call your congressman. Listeners, get involved. If you don't think this is right, 
get involved. I can't tell you to be politically active on one side or the other, so I'm still on active duty. But I can tell you to, to be politically active in a general sense. Make your own conclusions based on what you read, based on what you hear from us, and do something. Because if you don't want your kids serving in Syria in the same way we and potentially our kids served in Iraq and Afghanistan, then something has to happen now. Because we are on the road to forever war. And it's possible that the the reduction in people willing to enlist will put the U.S. on its on its back back foot a little bit as far as having the manpower to do something even bigger or worse. So, so I want to talk now about what happens to a brain when it's injured by a roadside bomb or an IED, improvised explosive device. That's what soldiers uh, refer to roadside bombs as. I found an article by a, a Dr. Ronald Glasser in, uh, from Task and Purpose, and he discusses how blast wave head injuries, again, commonly caused by roadside bombs, IEDs, cause a distinctly different type of head injury than blows to the head or even literally being shot in the head. Quote, since the 2002, uh, American military medicine has had to respond to that medical fact, and in doing so has taught us something important about the whole issue of brain trauma. Clearly, brain injuries from explosions are different than all the usual kinds of neurological injuries, penetrating head wounds and traumas from a fall, or simply being hit on the head from a hard object. Army neurosurgeons at combat surgical hospitals have told how they would rather take care of patients with penetrating head wounds from bullets because it was simpler. There was only the damage along the bullet's track, whereas with a blast injury, almost every part of the, uh, of the brain is damaged. Unfortunately, that is now an understanding shared by everyone involved with caring for a patient following a closed head injury by a passing blast wave from an exploding gas depot or a, a detonated roadside bomb. End quote. So, ordinarily, if you go into the ER and you're supposed to, you have a, a major head trauma, the main technique that they would use to help you with that is they would actually remove a part of the top of your skull to relieve the cranial pressure. However, in being hit with a head injury from a blast wave, the damage is, is super different. Dr. Glasser did point out, however, that pediatricians have seen this different kind of damage for decades, and they've seen it in infants that die from shaken baby syndrome, which if anybody's a parent, you know, understands about that and exactly how damaging it is to a young person's mind. Well, essentially, the damage is the same in that circumstance in being hit with a blast wave. The important point here is that relieving the cranial pressure of a victim of this kind of injury doesn't do nearly enough to prevent more serious and long-term brain issues. The biggest part of it, though, and really important for you and I, Danny, in looking at our service, is that the questions, the standard questions that you or I would have asked a soldier about losing consciousness or experiencing any lapse in time or memory, both of those could be answered no, but in reality, the person is still has substantial damage from that blast. And I've been near a couple of huge explosions myself, including that my, my truck was hit by an IED once. It's very possible that I could have some of this particular damage. Now, I had an MRI, I don't know, I think it was about two years after I got out, and they said that it was normal. But uh, who, who knows what will come around in the future. Now, this whole topic ties into the blast pressure damage that we've talked about before utilizing crew serve weapons, the, the ordinary everyday weapons, a 50 cal machine gun or a Mark 19 grenade machine gun. The, these, the use of these weapons creates enough blast pressure to give someone a miniature version of a concussion. Uh, we also could add to that the, the surges from riding hours and hours in a helicopter or possibly an MRAP service members deal with blast waves in a, in a huge assortment of, of different ways. So my ongoing question about this and my final thought on it for today is if both training for and fighting in a war where the weaponry and the battle damage causes this kind of brain trauma, at what point will we as Americans, will we as the U.S. collectively 
acknowledge the damage that just ordinary service in the military causes and how much da that damage is likely to affect their ability to being a leader. Because most of the branches, it's either up or out. You either get promoted or you leave the service. And so this is something that really needs to be studied in more thorough detail. I just recently shared an article, I think it was from the New York Times, on uh, my Facebook, which was about um, the uh, title of the article, something like PTSD is more of a physical than an emotional injury. And it talked about blasts and TBI and how it's related to PTSD, but how in general TBI and also PTSD, like it actually affects the brain in a physical way. Yeah. And it actually like physically changes you as a person by tweaking parts of the brain. And so what's interesting to me is that officially 7,000 Americans have died in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Give or take, 7,000. About 4,500 in Iraq, about 2,500 in Afghanistan. But 22 veterans a day kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Depression, anxiety, PTSD, they're all related. I suffer from all three. And there are days I don't want to wake up. And there are people who are a lot worse off than me. There are people who saw a lot more than me. So I'm not trying to play the smallest violin on the planet. I'm mean, just saying... Maybe it's time to start recognizing PTSD as a Purple Heart-worthy injury. Maybe it's time to start realizing that service in the military forever changes people physically. The brain, which is the most powerful of all the muscles or whatever the hell the brain is, the most powerful of all the organs, um, this is a serious, serious thing. You know, PTSD has an interesting history because in World War I it was called shell shock. And it was kind of looked down upon, like this guy's a coward almost, like he just had too much shells dropped on him. By World War II, they started calling it battle fatigue, you know, and they were a little more sympathetic to it, but it was still kind of like frowned upon. Now, finally, in Vietnam, it gets this like, just this terror. I mean, PTSD is like the worst acronym because it's, it's such a lifeless term, yeah. post-traumatic stress disorder. What it really is, is wounded in action. That's what it really is. Okay? Absolutely. Uh, emotionally and physically, now we know from the top scientists, wounded in action. So to look at it as just, uh, oh, it's a minor psychological issue. Oh, it's cowardice or some combination of the things we've said since World War One, It just totally obviates the military and the Department of Veterans Affairs for the responsibility to take care of these people for the rest of their lives. Because that's what it is. It is, it is the rest of your life that you need care. Yep. No, and, and, and when you mentioned the whole thing about World War II, I immediately flashed to the, the scene in Patton where the general slaps that soldier because he's just, he's just at his absolute wit's end. And we grew up thinking that that guy wasn't a man, that he wasn't, he wasn't trying his best, that he didn't want to be there for his comrades, and none of that was true. Um, and I think we're going to continue this down this path, Danny. I think we're going to continue to find other areas of soldiers' bodies that previously scientists and military leaders had no idea that simply serving in a war did this to people. And like you said, you know that the we because we still don't know. We don't know. Uh, yeah, it, guys carrying around so much weight and and they they can't express it to people. So absolutely. Well. As we transition back to policy, you guys know I usually run policy stuff because I'm a dork for the news. Here we are again, 2018, and he's out of the military, so I don't give a shit what I say. An irresponsible general saying irresponsible shit. That's what this next story is about. Military Times headline says, U.S. war with China is likely in 15 years, retired general says. Oh, that's nice. So Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who used to run U.S. Army Europe from like maybe 2014 to 2017, decided to go to the War Source Security Forum on Wednesday with his European allies and say, quote, I think in 15 years, it's not inevitable, but it is a very strong likelihood that we will be at war with China. What the fuck? Why? Tell me Why? The United States should engage in an existential war that is certain to cause tens if not hundreds of thousands of deaths with a nuclear-armed China, who is also our greatest trading partner. Someone explain to me why these generals don't realize their job is to protect the peace and only fight in the most 
anomalous situations only when desperate interests are at stake. It sounds like these generals want wars. They want like a big war with Russia or China so they can use their toys. That is an irresponsible statement. China controls an enormous amount of our debt. China is a major trading partner. China is not an innocent power. They're fucked up too. But so are we. They meddle in elections. We meddle in elections. They meddle in the South China Sea. We control the Caribbean Sea. Mm -hmm. Imagine if a Chinese general made this statement at the Shanghai Cooperation Council Forum. We would be up in arms about it, wouldn't we? Up in arms. We would be saying China is threatening us. They say they're going to be with wars in 15 years. They're going to be at war with us. But we just say it like just a passing statement. And this is a three-star general. Like you have a responsibility, sir, to be res- – to, to like – to to be a, like a mature adult and to try to avoid war, not to – Add to the call and the drumbeat of war. I here's my prediction. He might not be wrong, but here's the prediction from Danny. Danny says, "I don't think we'll be at war with China in 15 years. But if we are, it will be unnecessary, and it will be because of people like this. It'll be because of people like this who see war as inevitable. Just because they're the largest economy in the world or about to be the largest economy in the world does not mean that it's inevitable we fight a war with them. That would be a global disaster. First of all, global economy tanks." If the United States and China go to war and stop trading with each other, the global economy tanks. Get ready for the next Great Depression. Fact. Worldwide Great Depression. The second thing that happens, thousands of people die. Millions of people die. What is the point? China is rising. China's economy is rising. China's military, although much smaller than ours, is rising. You know why? China has a billion fucking people. They deserve to rise. Well, they, they, have, they don't deserve to take over the world, but that's not their intent, nor do they have the capacity for it. I hate this bellicose rhetoric. I, Henry, I literally hate it. Like it makes me just loathe this man for saying it. He thinks he's being like a strategist and making predictions. No, you're doing more than making predictions. You're making threats when you say that. How do you think China reads that? China reads that like, oh, I get that. We better get ready for war. America thinks one's coming. There's nothing that says that two great powers can't coexist. To think otherwise is a Lord of the Flies version of international affairs, and God help us if that's what it really is going to be. It sounds like almost like defense virtue signaling, you know, that, that hey, I'm, I'm applying for any openings at MSNBC or CNN because I can, I can get in on that. I can get in on hating China. And... They do understand that China really only competes with us economically. I mean, very seldom do we have any kind of military, anything from China. The South China Sea is is the biggest steps that they've taken in, in that direction at all. And I think generals are like, they, they don't understand that they can't advocate for strategy that is economic in nature. You know, they can't advocate for soft power. It's supposed to be the big stuff, the big guns, the... The things that that they know and love, when the reality is that economic power is so much more stabilizing, and lasts so much longer. But no one seems to seems to uh, seems to see that. What's the big gripe we have with China? It's Taiwan, and it's their actions in the South China Sea. But let's think about that again for a second. The South China Sea is their Caribbean. It's their Atlantic Ocean. It's right on their border, right? Yep. The United States has militarily intervened or invaded nearly every Caribbean island in its history. Most of this happened between 1898 and World War II, 1941. Who are we to tell the Chinese not to build sandbars and airstrips and try to control the South China Sea. Now, I don't want China to control everything in the South China Sea, but I think the best way to handle that is diplomatically at a major forum like the United Nations. The thought that the United States has the right to go 10,000 miles around the world with our fleet and tell China how to act in their Caribbean? Then we are asking for a war. How can we expect China to countenance the United States telling them how to act in their Caribbean when we would never allow that. We would go to nuclear war if someone tried to mess in our Caribbean. You know how I know that? I read about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Russia 
was allied with Cuba, put a few missiles in Cuba, we almost went to nuclear war over it. And yet we're telling China they don't have the same ability to expect security and prominence in their own Caribbean, which is the South China Sea. It's it's horrific. It's it's completely obtuse. It lacks any ability to put yourself in the enemy's shoes. And Jesus, even I just said enemy. They're not enemies. Like it's I'm so conditioned by these assholes like General Hodges to consider them an enemy. They're not an enemy. They're not a competitor. They're just another power. And if we don't learn to coexist, the earth could end. And you know what? We don't just have to coexist economically and militarily. We got to coexist environmentally because the two largest economies in the world are going to determine whether or not climate change ends human existence on this planet. We need to partner with China, not compete with China. Hell yes. Absolutely. No, it's like, it's like American leaders can't see beyond, uh, of a, a very neoconservative view of manifest destiny that we just continue beating at people's borders and beating at people's economies until nothing's left essentially the united states doesn't need to be a hegemon we can be an example to the world without being the owner of the world we can still protect american interests and american values without putting our military everywhere imagine if a chinese aircraft carrier tried to tried to drive between cuba and florida oh we'd lose our minds we'd go to we go to war we yeah. i think we go to absolutely to war american aircraft carriers you know sleek around the philippines and taiwan and the south china sea as a matter of course and the chinese put up with it now they're getting a little frustrated by it and we're like oh i guess we have to go to war with them in 15 years <laughs> it's it's wild they're it's wild it is, it's unbelievable I'd like to take a moment here and thank by name our four honorary producers that are supporting us on a Patreon. And they are Matthew Ho, Will Arens, Gage Counts, and Fahim Shirazi. Anyone who contributes $10 or more on Patreon each month will be listed as an honorary producer. To everyone else who contributes on Patreon, thank you so much as well. Your response has been really wonderful. Hey, everyone. I really hope you're enjoying the podcast. But truth be told, I need your help. No, I don't need you to move a couch or borrow a leaf blower. No, I need you to hit pause on your podcasting app right now and share this episode with somebody you know, somebody who you might think might be receptive to it. It could be a, a friend or relative who's considering joining the military or a veteran you know who might be interested in, in hearing a little more truth in their news about uh, military and veterans. We rely on you all to help us reach as many people as possible. So please hit that pause button right now and share this episode with somebody. Sharing all done? Good? Okay, good deal. I know Uncle Al will cuss a lot listening to the episode, but he'll appreciate it when the cursing stops. Now I want to mention something about Patreon. We are always in the market for more Patreon supporters. So if you get the chance, please come out and support us. You could support us for as little as a dollar a month. And what do you get for your dollar, you ask? Well, you get a one-minute drop on any topic you choose once a month. Just email us your question or comment and we'll give it the old Henry Danny breakdown on air. Guaranteed to have 60 seconds of our time. We may spend more on it. Um, we prefer to do military and veteran topics, but whatever topic you think might be pertinent. And we may spend a whole bunch more time talking about it, depending on the topic. And for contributors, a bit north of a dollar a month, we have some bonus episodes, some essays of mine, and a few other things as well. We're still in the process of, of building our rewards, so if you have any suggestions for Patreon rewards, please let me know. Now, back to the podcast. All right, Danny, you ready to answer a, a patron question? Yeah, I can't wait. All righty. We have uh, one of our new contributors on Patreon, David Blobaum, 
asks, what do vets and active duty troops think about the suspension of posi comitatus and habeas corpus, or are most even aware this has even taken place? Well, I'm going to start out by answering that by saying most don't know or care. Unfortunately, most veterans aren't like you and I. Most veterans are, you know, great people, but they're not necessarily as politically engaged. They're not following foreign policy the way that we are. And most of them probably don't give a shit. Now, if they were informed, they might be alarmed the same way that I'm alarmed and that you're alarmed. Yep. Just as a brief history, I mean, first of all, habeas corpus means that we can't just arrest someone and hold them indefinitely. If we arrest them, we have to charge them with something and give them due process, right? We have to give them a speedy trial and whatever else the Constitution demands. We've suspended habeas corpus a number of times. The first time was during the Civil War, um, and, uh, and we've done it since 9-11. We've put American citizens in prison indefinitely, and we've put foreign citizens in prison indefinitely, and not given them the right to habeas corpus, at least until – uh, Boom and Ian versus Bush, uh, the Supreme Court rule, we had to provide some sort of trial for the people of Guantanamo. Now, posse comitatus is uh, from the late 19th century, and what it basically says is the United States Army cannot be used, or the United States military cannot be used to quell domestic disturbances. That's the job of the police and the National Guard. The federal army is not to be used against American citizens. Well, we all know that's bullshit now. We've, 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 you know, chipped away at those rights, those important rules for so long that we now live in a military state. We really do. It's a police state. If we started a new anti-war movement and got millions in the streets, if you don't think that any president, be it Obama or Donald Trump, wouldn't use federal soldiers to shut that down, then you misunderstand the nature of power. The owners of this country, meaning the corporate capitalists and their political lackeys who they control with money, will not put up with domestic disturbance, and they will certainly ignore posse comitatus and employ the federal army like the 101st Airborne to put that down. If you don't think that's true, look at the riots in the 1960s. We had airborne infantry in goddamn Watts in, in, in Los Angeles during the riots. We also had the National Guard, but we also sent in U.S. active duty soldiers. I'm alarmed by this. Um, and I'm really glad for this question because it's, it's, it's a very astute question. It, it, it demonstrates that, uh, that our, that our listener and our Patreon, um, representative is informed about the real issues that are getting ignored by the, by the mainstream media. Cause you know, you've never heard that story. The, the words posse comitatus have probably not been said on CNN for like 30 years. Yeah. Sounds about right. I, um, I saw this really interesting note. Um, from Keith, uh, Keith Oberman when he was still on MSNBC and he was reporting on the Bush's, Bush administration's suspension of habeas corpus. He, he mentioned that nine with, without the right of habeas corpus, nine out of ten rights in our Bill of Rights are useless because each one requires that you are given some mention of due process, whatever it is. The only one that remains is the third one, which is troop quartering. You can't let active troops can't you know come and sleep wherever the fuck they want. Wow, that's just I, I mean, I, I, so our entire system is based on due process. If people aren't given the opportunity of it, then nobody has any rights. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the greatest damage of the war on terror is not the seven thousand Americans and perhaps one million Arabs and Afghans that have been killed. The greatest damage of the war on terror is to the Republican institutions of this government, a small R Republican. Um, we are throwing away the Constitution. We are throwing away the Bill of Rights. We are throwing away our civil liberties in the name of a war against a ghost. Terrorism is a ghost. It is a tactic. It is not it is not a person, it is not a country. It is a war that will never end, and it is a war that will break this republic. Mark my words. If we don't stop it from the grassroots, listen, it's not going to be a top-down solution. The owners of this country don't want the war on terror to end because the owners of this country have a lot of investments in Boeing and Lockheed Martin. No, the only way this is going to end is with pressure from the grassroots. People like you and I, people who work at McDonald's, people who work at Walmart, people with middle-class salaries. When they combine on the streets, that's the only time we're going to overturn this system. Absolutely. I could not could not fucking agree with you more. Oh. All right. Uh, 
Our last headline for today, guys, is we're going to talk about a, a new report that's about to be released on the United States Army about its operations in the Iraq War and some very specific criticisms that it, uh, it outlines. Um, there was a, a new Army Times article that outlined some of these, so I'm going to go through just a couple of them real quick here. And, um, but uh, expect that Danny and I are going to, once the full report comes out, we will probably spend a lot of time talking about this. In the, you know, we'll probably dedicate a, an entire episode to it. Yes, yes, yes. It'll basically be the history of the Iraq War. So, uh, First thing, not enough troops were sent to Iraq for the coalition to fight back both the Iranian backed Shia militias and the Sunni insurgency. Uh, there was no effective strategy for deterring Syria and Iran from supporting proxy forces in the U.S. Syria supported the Sunni insurgency, while Iran uh, stood behind the uh, Shia militias. Um, not raising an autonomous police or military force that could fight unsupported by coalition forces. Um, you know, even when I le- the last time I was in Iraq, which was in July of 2008. You know, there were we were working with Iraqi police officers who had been doing training for years that had been trained with soldiers and all kinds of things. And they still were not capable of handling their missions without us watching, watching over their shoulders. Um, we didn't have a, an, a clearly established detainee policy. Quote, the U.S. decided at the outset not to treat captured insurgents or militia fighters as prisoners of war and then never developed an effective way to handle detainees. Most Sunni insurgents ended up returning to the battlefield, end quote. Um, the instability of democracy, of, of creating democracy, uh, quote, U.S. commanders believed that the 2005 Iraqi elections would have a, quote, calming effect, but those elections instead exacerbated ethnic and sectarian tensions, end quote. Um, and the last, as far as just going down these real quick, is the uh, General Casey's uh, choice to consolidate U.S. forces on large FOBs or forward operating bases, which created a security vacuum in between the large bases. So, aside from seeing the whole report, what do these few bullet, bullet points point out to us? First, it screams to me, unprepared for any possibility of insurgency, as it's clear that the planners didn't consider that tactic to be something that was likely in the, in the early days of the war. It screams lack of any kind of supporting diplomatic structure. You guys might remember that President Bush famously wanted us to go it on our own. So there were countries that, you know, that they either didn't participate or were flat out against it. But we did not attempt to do that. We didn't attempt to plan any kind of diplomatic infrastructure before the war began. It shows that we as Americans are still completely bought off by the notion of spreading democracy, even when looking at them from a from an empirical standpoint, the social and economic conditions won't support it. It shows a clear lack of cultural understanding in the, in the Arab world. Um, the tribal issues that plagued the Iraq war weren't unknowable. They were just inconvenient to George W. Bush and his war planners. It shows a a stark contrast in how the people of Iraq felt betrayed by our failure to secure the country following the first Gulf War. I had an interpreter that was with my squad on my first tour tell me that 200,000 people were slaughtered by Saddam Hussein following our withdrawal in 1991. George W. H. W. Bush told the Iraqis to fight Saddam, and that's what they did. And then after we left, Saddam and his forces massacred them. Um... It also reminds me to point out the general knowledge that Gulf War leaders, including General and Future Secretary of State Colin Powell uh, and uh, Gulf War Commander Norman Schwarzkopf, along with President Bush Sr., admitted that they had no viable exit strategy for the coalition if they had taken Baghdad in 1991. So they didn't do it. That information was completely ignored by George W. Bush. And my last thing on this for today the testimony of Army Chief of Staff General Eric Shinseki to Congress that it would take 200,000 troops to secure Iraq. He had no issue with it. He just wanted people to be open about this is what it's going to take. When Donald Rumsfeld heard that, Shinseki was forced out as Chief of Staff and had to retire. He was right, and he was attempting to sober the reality of securing a nation of 26 million people. But unfortunately, that wasn't politically expedient to our leaders at that time. 
You know, you've hit the key points of the study, and I'm not going to go into those because you hit them so well. But what's interesting to me is that this report has been suppressed. It was General Odierno who was spent like five years in Iraq in a number of different roles, division commander, assistant commander, and then full commander of the war. He actually um, asked for this book. It's a book. I mean, it's a, it's a history to be written about America's operations in Iraq. But for the last two years since Odierno has left and been replaced, uh, the Army has not released this report. And a lot of people are speculating that it's because it's critical of the Army. It's a, it's a self-critical, self-aware analysis of the Army's failures in Iraq. And, you know, there's this colonel who just retired in August. His name is Frank Sobchak. He was the study team's final director for this book. He said, quote, We worked tirelessly for three years to complete a scholarly product that captured the war's lessons in a readable historic narrative. And, he said, that the army was paralyzed with apprehension for the past two years over its publishing, it leaves me disappointed with the institution to which I dedicated my life. This raises a question. Why does the army not want this out there? Why do they not want you reading it? Are we not willing to critique ourselves you know what war we never wrote an official history of vietnam and how did that work out we lost all the lessons of the vietnam war so we were utterly unprepared for an insurgency in 2003 in iraq are we setting ourselves up for this to happen next time the army needs to take a hard look at itself we all do if we if we refuse to critique ourselves we'll never improve this is a disaster this report needs to come out in full and it needs to come out soon, and it needs to be open and honest. Look, serious people worked on this. My old boss uh, at West Point was involved in the history. He was a, he was actually the historian in Baghdad for a while. General H.R. McMaster, the former National Security Advisor, he actually reviewed it and found it to be a good report. Okay, so this is not like it's outside the mainstream. It's within the mainstream. But the Army is scared to death to release it. And I don't even think the report goes far enough. To tell you the truth, I think the report is too worried about tactical stuff. What the po- report should really say is that we should have never went in the first place and it was an unwinnable situation in the first place. It's not going to say that because the Army is more focused on what happened on the ground. But I think a more in, a more impressive report, a more holistic report from, from something above the Army would say the war was never winnable and never should have been fought. Um, this report talks more about once it was fought, what we did wrong. And we did a lot of things wrong. Like you mentioned, detainee policy, troop numbers, bases, large bases versus small bases. I mean, all the things you point out, all the key bullet points that you so astutely pointed out. Look, that's all true. There's nothing wrong with admitting mistakes. Because anybody who watched the Iraq war for 15 years, it's still going, so it's 15 years, and thinks we didn't make mistakes, wasn't paying attention. It's time for the army to be open, self-reflective, and willing to critique itself. It requires that. Any large bureaucracy requires an ability to learn lessons from its past. And the minute we stop doing that is the minute we walk into fascism. I got the feeling from reading the the few bullet points they had on Army Times that while they were they, – they seemed okay with criticism from the Army down, but anything that was going to be – was going to go to – towards George W. Bush, towards Colin Powell, Don Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, all those kind of people, it, the bullets were kind of written in a way that made it seem like they weren't there at all. And I think that that's going to be the big thing, is that how does the Army appropriately and necessarily criticize itself without drawing political flack from the neoconservatives and the story that they sold everybody on Iraq? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Iraq will go down, I promise you. As a historian, I'm pretty confident in this. Iraq will go down as one of the great foreign policy disasters in American history. It'll be right up there with Vietnam, the Mexican-American War, and some other, the Philippine insurgency. It'll be right up there with some of the worst decisions in American history. Um, The least we can do as an army is to critique our own tactics and our own operations. Because the American people as a whole, the United States... Washington as a whole needs to do a study like this that takes a hard look at what the hell were we trying to accomplish 
and why did it fail and why was it why was it wrong from the start to even try and and let's not forget that there's still a whole bunch of collective whitewashing going on of the Iraq war George W Bush getting the freedom medal coming up on veterans day you you can't you can't you, you those two can't exist in your brain together or it just explodes that does it just doesn't work but that's but that's that's what's being sold and and that's what they want people to fucking live with it's amazing he drew a few pictures of like dead or wounded veterans and suddenly he's like a hero for veterans meanwhile he created two million veterans in an unnecessary war right and like we don't talk about that but we talk about his pretty paintings and suddenly he's a hero because everyone's so horrified by trump that suddenly we've like had a new uh a new appreciation for bush but meanwhile george bush was the one who who, who started this war yep. started this unnecessary unwinnable war and we can't forget that because we can't give a pass you cannot give a free pass to people just because they're not as obtuse and because they're not as vulgar as the current president we're on twitter at fortress on a hill and also on facebook.com at fortress on a hill you can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at fortress on a hill.com itunes stitcher soundcloud patreon spotify you name it almost anywhere you listen we're already waiting for you and hey we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a contributor at Patreon.com. If you're not into doing a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link for that is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget that. We'll see you next time. good people And listen to my song I will not